Hello. Thanks for joining me for reading Paul's mail. Well, we finished Philippians last night. I think now we've gone through at, at least eight or nine of the books or letters that Paul wrote to the churches. And tonight we're going to go in a little different direction. Up until now, all of the letters that we have read have been to churches, to congregations of people. But tonight we're going to take a different direction and we're going to read a letter that was not written to an entire church. We're going to read a letter that was written to one person. It was written to a young man named Timothy. So let's get right into it as we unpack 1 Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, he meant that it was through his preaching that Timothy became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was a spiritual child of Paul because Paul had preached the gospel to him and he had believed the word of the Lord. So he's his true child in the faith. All right. So he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he says something very interesting. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogy, which promote speculation rather than stewardship from God that is by faith. And I want to go back here to the very first phrase, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, give you a little bit of background on Timothy. Okay, now, T Paul first went out on one missionary journey, and then he, he returned. And on that first missionary journey with Barnabas, he went to Derby and Lystra, to Iconium, Derby, and Lystra. And here we're reading, it says chapter 16, and of course you know in reading Paul's mail, we don't use chapter and verse numbers. But uh, what you're reading here comes from Bible Gateway, by the way. Paul came also to Derby and Lystra, but this was his second time to be at Derby and Lystra. He'd already been there once. And then they left and went to other cities. And then before they went back to end their first missionary journey, they returned to Lystra and Derby. So, so that's what Paul is talking about here. Paul came also to L Derby and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. And how did he become a disciple? Well, he became a disciple the first time Paul was there. See, this is the second time we're reading about now. The first time Paul was there, he heard the gospel. And that was when he became a believer. And his mother, as we see right here, was a Jewish woman. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. So Lystra, Derby, and Iconium were kind of like three cities that were close to one another. In fact, let's take a look here real quick. Here we are again on our map of the areas where Paul ministered. And you notice right here, here's our good old friend, the Black Sea. Remember when we read the letter to Rome, when we read the letter to Galatians, and we identified where Galatia was, that Here's the Black Sea, if you can see my little cursor there. There's the Black Sea, that big body of blue water. And then down here at the bottom, along this coastline here, was Galatia, which, if you remember from our previous podcast, was not just one town, it was a series of towns. It was kind of like a county, or kind of like a region, the region of Galatia. And there was lots of little towns there, and that's where the Galatian churches were. Well, then Paul came to Derby and to Lystra. And where is Lystra? Well, it's right here. Zoom in on it. Right there is Lystra. Right smack dab in the middle of my screen. I'm trying to pull it down so it will be. And that's Lystra. So that's where Timothy lived. He lived in Lystra. And so the first time Paul came through, his mother and his grandmother as well, I believe, became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and Timothy as well. And we'll read about that later on in another letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. But in this first letter, we're reading about how f Paul first met Timothy and, and what happened that led to him writing this letter. So there is, is Lystra, 
And somewhere over here on the left, I can't remember exactly where it is, Paul received a, a vision from the Lord, a dream from the Lord of a man of Macedonia, saying, come over here and help us. Okay, well, Timothy was with Paul when he had that vision, when he had that dream. And there's Ephesus right there. So Ephesus is right there, and then Lystra is over here south of it. I don't know if you can see both of those well enough, but there's two little red markers. And the top one here is, uh, is Ephesus right there at the very top in the middle. And then down here somewhere in the bottom is Lystra. So they went up the road went up north to Ephesus. And that was where, you know, Paul has this vision. I don't know if he was in Ephesus or not, but I know that Timothy was there. And so Paul urged Timothy to stay in Ephesus instead of coming with Paul to Macedonia. He says, as I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any other doctrine. And the thing that stood out to me about this was the fact that Timothy had authority. He was able to give a charge to people not to teach any other doctrine, and the ones who weren't just rebellious to begin with listened and obeyed. <clears throat> he says, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths, and I think he's referring here to Jewish myths, and endless genealogies, and that had to do with Gnosticism, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The stewardship from God that is by faith. And I want to, uh, to have us look at this for a minute because this word stewardship is very interesting. The word stewardship comes from a Greek word, like most of the words in the New Testament do, <laughs> since the New Testament was written in Greek. And this word is dispensation, not dispensation, this word administration comes from the Greek word okonomia, and it is translated as dispensation in the King James Version of the Bible. Now, modern day theology, theology that's been modern throughout the 20th century, and it's beginning to wane a little bit here in the 21st century, but because certain people wanted to support certain versions of of the end times theology, certain doctrines related to the return of Jesus and the end times theology. Because of that, they decided to use the word dispensation as if, as if it were a period of time, that a dispensation is a period of time. However, when you go back to the New Testament, to the original language the New Testament was written in, the word dispensation is the translation of this word oikonomia, Strong's G, 3622, Oikonomia, Oikonomia. Let me play that once again. Strong's G, 3622, Oikonomia, Oikonomia. So that is the Greek word, and it is translated in the King James Version of the Bible as dispensation. However, it doesn't mean periods of time. Dispensations are not periods of time. Well, then what are they? Well, here's what the the dictionary, the Vines Expository Dictionary. Okay, the word dispensation or oikonomia primarily signifies the management of a household or of household affairs. So it comes from two root words, oikos, <coughs> which means a house, and nomos, which means a law. So literally, the definition of the word dispensation is law of the house law of the household, and then the management or administration of the property of others, and so a stewardship. And that's what we're looking at right here when Paul says, charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. And that stewardship from God is the same word, oikonomia. It is management. It is stewardship, managing somebody else's property. And the church of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ does not belong to man. It belongs to God because it's the gospel of God 
concerning his son. We've read that in previous podcasts. The gospel of God concerning his son. So it's God's gospel. It belongs to God. And he assigns certain people and gives them a responsibility, makes them stewards of his gospel. And so when Paul said he had a dispensation of grace, he wasn't talking about a period of time. Had nothing at all to do with time. No measurement of time involved at all. What he was saying is, I have been given a responsibility from God to manage the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles so that they might come into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. They might become a part of the Israel of God because the church originally was all Jewish. The gospel went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And so Paul was appointed as an apostle, just like Peter, James, and John, Bartholomew, and Matthew, he was appointed an apostle, and he preached the very same gospel that Peter preached, that John preached, that Matthew preached, that Thomas preached, that Bartholomew preached. They didn't preach two different gospels. They all preached one gospel, the same gospel. The reason God chose the apostle Paul to be the apostle of the Gentiles, I think primarily is because out of all of the apostles, that the Lord chose during his earthly ministry, Paul was probably the one with the greatest education in the things of the law of God. As he said, as we read in a previous podcast, he had all of these things to boast about in the flesh, more than anybody else. If anybody had a reason to boast, it was Paul. But he counted it all a loss for the excellently excellency of knowing Christ Jesus, the Lord. And so... Paul was equipped ahead of time. Before he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, he was equipped ahead of time, especially by God, to be able to take the gospel that would have been easily understood by Jews if they had faith, and to take that gospel which would not be understandable by any Gentile because unless they were proselytes to Judaism, unless they had studied the law of God, unless they knew about the history of God and Israel, they wouldn't have had a clue. But God chose the Apostle Paul to bring the same gospel to the Gentiles that all of the other 12 apostles of the Lamb were bringing to the Jews. Paul didn't have a different gospel. And I'm hearing this out on the Internet People talking about how there's two Gospels and talking about how, you know, if, you're, if we're a Gentile and we're in the, in the church today and we're a Gentile, well, Paul's the only apostle we're to listen to. Paul is our apostle. You know, Matthew and Peter and James and John and, and Bartholomew and all the rest of them, well, they're not for us. They're, they were just apostles to the Jews. Well, the first person that God chose to go and preach the Gospel to the Gentiles was a Jew. It wasn't Paul. It was Peter. And Peter went and, and preached to the Gentiles. And it was through his mouth, he testified, that the Gentiles had faith and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and Gentiles became, be, began coming into the church. And, and it's not the Gentiles' fault that the majority of the Jews living in that day rejected Jesus, or that the majority of Jews today reject Jesus. I didn't the Gentiles' fault. It's, you know, whosoever the Lord calls can be saved. Whoever, whoever believes on the name of the Lord can be saved. But you have to choose. You have to choose to believe. You have to choose to have faith. And some do choose to have faith. And they are transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. They're translated out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God's Son. Now, do they have to stop being Jews? To be believers in Jesus? No. They don't have to stop being Jews. They still have freedom in Christ. In fact, they have more freedom in Christ now than they did before. But there's only one gospel, friends. Just one. It's the same gospel for Jew and Gentile. Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scripture. He was seen by many credible and reliable eyewitnesses after his resurrection. That is the gospel. That's the gospel that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. 
He said, you crucified the Messiah. And it said they were cut to the heart. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And Paul basically preached the same thing when he went out on his first missionary journey. We read that previously in another podcast, how he went into the synagogue, as he always did. That was his pattern of ministry. He went to the Jew first, and then he went to the Gentile. And so he went to the Jews. He preached the gospel. Some Jews would believe, and they would come into the church, the Israel of God. Other Jews would reject it. And then eventually they'd get angry enough to drive Paul and his companions out of the synagogue, and they'd have to go to another place to continue meeting, continue teaching the word of the Lord. But that was a pattern that happened in Paul's ministry over and over and over again. In fact, when Paul came to Lystra, it was because he'd been driven out of another place. And so they actually left the place where they were being persecuted and went to Lystra, and that's where Timothy's mother and grandmother and Timothy heard the gospel from Paul. And then on his second time through, Paul wanted to take Timothy with him in the ministry. So this is the Timothy we're reading about here. This is the Timothy that Paul wrote this letter to that we're reading about. And Paul urged him to remain at Ephesus, to charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. Let's go on. The aim of our charge, here's the reason Paul gives him this charge, is agape. That's the end goal of it all. Man comes up to Jesus, expert in the law, he asks Jesus, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says, here's the greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall agape the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then Jesus gave him a second greatest that he didn't even ask for. The second greatest commandment was, and love your neighbor, agape your neighbor as yourself. These two commandments fulfill all of the law. They fulfill all of the law. The law and the prophets, said Jesus, hang on these two commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Notice that he didn't give a list of doctrine. He didn't give a list of precise formulas and, and, and precise rituals and in pro, in precise ceremony of the, you know, okay, you have to do these things in this order in this certain way, and you, you, can't, you can't deviate from it or, or it doesn't count, and you got to do it all over again. Oh, that's what he didn't say. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Well, how do you do that? You do that by reading the Word. You do that by praying. You do that by listening, listening for the voice of the Lord in your spirit and by doing what Jesus commands. If you love me, Jesus said, you will keep my commandments. And anyone who does not love me will not keep my commandments. He made it pretty simple, didn't he? Wasn't complicated in the least. So the aim of this charge Paul gave to Timothy is that same agape, that same love. And remember what agape is? Agape is not based on emotion. Agape is not based on feeling, on how you feel about someone or how you feel about something. Agape is based upon a decision. Agape is based upon a choice. Agape is based upon having compassion for others around you according to their need and doing something yourself to try to meet that need. Being willing to take a risk to meet that need. Being willing to spend yourself on behalf of someone else to meet that need. And being a neighbor and making a neighbor out of everyone with whom you come into contact. That is agape, and that is the greatest commandment. It isn't how you're baptized. It isn't how you do communion. It isn't what kind of songs you sing when you meet together with other believers. It's got nothing to do with that at all. Now, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, there was very precise rules 
on how you had to pr- how you had to approach God. And the reason for that was because Jesus had not yet died on the cross to take away the sin of the world. And so there had to be a sacrificial system so that the blood of bulls and goats, which could not take away sin, but they could cover it temporarily, there had to be that sacrificial system in order for people to draw near to God. But now that Jesus has died on the cross, we don't need all of those religious ceremonies. We don't need all of those civil dietary laws that Israel had. We don't need those anymore. Why? Because God is no longer behind a curtain in a tent or behind a curtain in a temple. He broke out. You know, on, on, the, on the day of Jesus' crucifixion, there was a great earthquake, and it says the veil in the temple was rent in two from top to bottom against the seam. In other words, the most difficult way for it to be torn because it was all threaded the certain way, and it was if you were going to tear it, you want to tear it for the sides because that's the way it was woven. That's the way it was created. Instead, it was torn from top to bottom. And I always heard it preached all my life. That was so we would have access to God. But it, not just that, friend. It's so God could have access to us and not consume us. See, it's, it's, it's a two-way street. Not only do we have access to God, but he has access to us. And he wants to come and make his home in our heart, in our spirit. He wants to send his Holy Spirit to dwell in us. He wants to send his Holy Spirit to manifest himself in us and manifest himself through us. That's his desire. And so it's not about all the things that are of an outward appearance. It's about what's in the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And that makes all the difference. All right, let's go back to our scripture. The aim of our charge is agape. That issues, that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Those are the most important things we can have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. A pure heart. What does that mean? A pure heart is a heart that is an undivided devotion to the Lord. A pure heart is a heart that is the same all the way through. A pure heart is a heart that is not mixed with a thing, a love of the things of this world that are in competition and contrast with the love of God. Because what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. Don't love the Lord half-heartedly. Don't love the Lord with half your mind. Don't love the Lord with half your soul. Don't, don't love the Lord with half your strength or a quarter of your strength. All your strength, all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. That's pure if, if, if there's something in the world, something in this world that you love in addition to loving God and you get into a quandary about, well, which am I going to serve? Am I, am I going to serve God or, or am I going to serve this fleshly desire that I have in my heart right now? Who am I going to serve? Well, if you have a pure heart, the answer is simple. You're going to serve God because you have a pure heart. Your heart is not divided. And if you find that your heart is divided, go to the Lord in prayer. Confess it. Admit it. Say the same thing about it that God says about it. Say, Lord, I've got a divided heart. Lord, I know my heart's not pure because not only do I desire you, but I desire everything else over here as well. So I've not got a pure heart because I'm mixing it with something else. And I'm not talking about some kind of weird legalistic form of, of harsh treatment of the body or asceticism or, or anything like that. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the attitude of our heart, the motivation. What drives us? What has the most value? What we have the most attachment to? That's what he's talking about, a pure heart. Okay? So the agape issues from a pure heart and a good conscience. What does that mean? A good conscience means that you know how to feel God telling you something is wrong. And you know how to feel God telling you something is right. It's it's. Not learning it out of a book, not learning it because some person has given you a list of rules to follow, but because your heart is in tune with God, and so you're receiving revelation from God as to what is right and what is wrong. You remember a few weeks ago when I talked to you about Reese Howes and how he went to London and didn't wear a hat? Now, there was nothing big about wearing a hat or not wearing a hat in and of itself. That isn't the point. 
The point is that God had spoken to Reese Howes before he left for London, told him, don't wear a hat. And Reese Howes, he wasn't Pentecostal. He didn't believe in speaking in tongues. He didn't believe in prophecies. He didn't believe in, in, in faith healing. He didn't believe in any of the things that are stereotypical of how people identify Pentecostals today. He didn't believe any of that, but he did believe in the Holy Spirit. He even believed in the baptism in the Holy Spirit separate from him being born again because after he confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, Reese Howes prayed for the Holy Spirit to come to him. He prayed for the gift of the Holy Spirit after he believed. I don't know how many of you know Dr. Bill Bright, who he was. It's been a few years now, but he was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. It was a campus ministry way back in the 70s, maybe even in the 60s. I don't know when it started. But I remember a tract that I read from Campus Crusade for Christ. It was written by Dr. Bill Bright. And in that tract, Dr. Bright explained how to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He explained how to pray, how to, how to come to God and confess your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and come to the knowledge of God. But then after that, Right in that very tract, and Dr. Bright was not Pentecostal either. He was not Pentecostal, no way, shape, or form. He explained to the people how to receive the Holy Spirit after they believed. Now, he had a little different way of doing it than what I would tell you to do, but he did say that you have to receive the Holy Spirit by faith, and you have to ask for the Holy Spirit to come into you. It's just not on automatic pilot, friends. It's not just something that you believe happen, happens without any evidence. And I'm not talking about the evidence of living in the Spirit. There's a difference between the evidence of living in the Spirit, the evidence of walking in the Spirit. That takes place over a period of time, okay? And you produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is the evidence of walking in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is evidence of living in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is is evidence of being led by the Spirit. But that's not the same thing as the Spirit initially entering your life. Something should happen. When you're born again, that happens in the spiritual realm. That's invisible to you. You, you don't see the Holy Spirit breathe new life on your human spirit. That's in the spiritual realm. It's invisible to the physical eyes. You, you, don't, you don't see that. But when the Holy Spirit comes into you, there should be something supernatural that takes place right then, right there, that is different than anything else you have ever experienced that should let you know the Holy Spirit has arrived. You've asked the Father for the gift of the Spirit after you're born again. It won't do you any good to ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit before you're born again because you can't receive him. You must be born again first in order to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But once you are born again, once you believe the gospel, once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have authority, you have power to ask the Father for the gift of the Holy Spirit, and he will give you good gifts. That's what Jesus tried to tell them. He said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him you need to ask after we've believed on the lord after we've confessed our sin after we have repented of our sin after we have confessed our faith in the lord jesus christ we need to ask the father for the gift of the holy spirit now you might have a problem with what i'm saying tonight because you're going to say but pastor randy my church don't teach this well i got news for you. your church isn't god your pastor although you should respect and honor him as the leader of your congregation, isn't God. God is God. Jesus is God in the flesh. And Jesus said, ask the Father. Ask the Father for the gift of the Holy Spirit after you've believed. And then receive the Holy Spirit the same way you receive the new birth, by faith, believing that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And then let the Holy Spirit manifest himself through you. Be willing to obey the Holy Spirit. And if he wants to manifest himself through you in a supernatural way that you've never experienced before, 
Yield to the Holy Spirit. Do what the Holy Spirit prompts you to do, and he'll manifest himself, and you'll know he's there. You'll know he's there. I'm not talking about trying to prove anything to anybody else. You need to know in your heart the Holy Spirit has come in to abide. And every time it's recorded in Scripture that people were initially filled with the Holy Spirit, something supernatural happened. Something that could be seen and something that could be heard. Now, did that mean, hey, we've arrived? No. Remember what I told you about the new birth? The new birth isn't the finish line. It's the starting gate. It's the beginning of the journey. Well, guess what? Receiving the Holy Spirit isn't the finish line either. If you're going to go participate in a race or go into a battle or something, first, you, you've got to be in the army. <laughs> you've got to be a part of the force, okay? I don't mean the Star Wars force. I mean the, the military force. That, that is what is, equates to being born again. You're a part of the force. You're, you're part of the unit. You know, you're part of the battalion or whatever. I don't know what all those terms really mean. I've not studied them up much. But anyway, that is, that's being born again. Being born again is getting you in the army. I'm trying to just give you an illustration. It's not literally. Although, spiritually speaking, it could be the army of the Lord. So that, that's what the new birth is. It's getting you in the army. So what's baptism in the Holy Spirit? What's receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit about? That's getting you clothed and equipped for the journey. That's getting you clothed and equipped for the journey. You know, I remember when I was about, I guess I must have been nine years old, and I don't think that I can remember we'd ever been to a public swimming pool much, but we were living up in Zionsville, Indiana. My dad had a job up there, and we'd moved up there for a while. We had a, a friend, a, a, I don't know, extended, kind of an extended family member come and visit us up there in Zionsville. And they, they wanted to go swimming. So I'm nine years old. You know, I've gotten smarter than I was since then. And just because when you get done with your story, you're going to wonder. <laughs> I didn't ever been to a public swimming pool before. And I didn't understand what the numbers around the sides of the pool meant. I thought they meant age. And it just so happened, of course, you know, the boys go in the boys' locker room to get their swim trunks on. The girls go in the girls. So my mom and, and our friend and my little sister, they all went in the ladies' side. I went in the men's side and got my trunks on and locked up my clothes in the locker and everything like that. And so I run out to get in the pool, and I, I decided I was going to go jump in the pool. And so I started looking for where the nine-year-olds were supposed to go. And guess what happened? I saw that number nine on the side of the pool. Now, thank God I didn't jump in. <laughs> but I, I didn't understand. I, I, I wasn't really equipped because I didn't have an understanding of everything. And when you're born again, you don't have an understanding of everything. You need to be equipped. You need to be clothed so that you can have authority to become a son of God. You know, it says to, to all who believed on him, to them gave he power. And that word power is the word exousia. It's not the word dunamis, dynamite. We always talk about the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit. This is the exousia power, the authority power. You have authority when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You have authority to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You have authority to to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have authority to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. You have authority for the Holy Spirit to manifest himself through you in accordance with God's word. But you need to ask. I didn't know this was the way the Lord was going to lead me tonight, but I just feel like I'm going in the direction he wants me to. And it still relates to what we're reading here in Timothy. He says, The aim of our charge is agape that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience. And that's where the good conscience comes from. It comes from the Holy Spirit living inside of you, leading and guiding you, you walking in the Holy Spirit, learning through the Holy Spirit to discern good from evil. Because there's things you're going to face in this life that people in other generations haven't had to face. And there's not always going to be a clear command in the Scripture that you can go to. Now, for some things, there will be. You won't have any problem. You just, here's what it says in the Word. But there's other things you're going to have questions about. There's other things that you're going to be puzzled about. And you need some way to discern good from evil. That's what the good conscience is about. The Holy Spirit enables you to discern good from evil. 
And when you have a pure heart that's undivided in devotion to the Lord, and you have a good conscience that's able to discern good and evil through the power of the Holy Spirit, then you can have a sincere faith. You're not faking it. You're faithing it. I'll say that again. You're not faking it. You're faithing it because you're believing God exists. You're believing he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and you are diligently seeking him and having corresponding action in your life. And when you have all of those, the pure heart, the good conscience, sincere faith, that will produce the agape in your life. All right, so let's go on. Praise the Lord. Okay, certain person, by swerving from these, what are these? A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. There are certain persons that swerve from these. Don't swerve from those. Don't swerve from them. Stay with them. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertion. And then Paul goes on and says this. He's writing this now to an individual. He's writing it to a leader in the church at Ephesus. Timothy is a leader. I'm not going to say he was a pastor because I'm not really sure that's the role that he actually had in the church at Ephesus, given that he was a part of Paul's ministry team. And Paul had an apostolic ministry. It doesn't say in the scripture that Timothy was a pastor. He wasn't really even an elder because literally in those days, an elder was an elderly elder person, <laughs> an older man, okay? Because later, Paul's going to say something concerning Timothy's youth. So Timothy is a young man. Not really sure he's a pastor because I don't even believe they had the pastor model that we have today. Back in those days, we'll see it later when we read Paul's letter to Titus. And actually, we'll read it here a little later on. They appointed elders, a plurality of elders in their churches. But it wasn't just a popularity contest based on personality or based on wealth or based on influence. It was men equipped and chosen by God, men full of the Holy Spirit, just like Stephen. Remember, we haven't read about that yet, but Stephen was a man full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. That's the kind of people they looked for to be elders. It wasn't the guy that was the most successful businessman. It wasn't the guy that looked the nicest, all dressed up. It wasn't the guy that had the most money, had the most political power and influence. It was a man full of the Holy Spirit. That's what they looked for when they appointed elders. He says, we know that the law is good. The law is good if one uses it lawfully. Now listen to that. What's that saying? That's saying there's a right way to use the law and there's a wrong way to use the law. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just. Who are the just? Those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are the just. They have been justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and the law is not for them. Why? Because they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They're to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. When they believe the word of the Lord, when they believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they call upon the name of the Lord. They're saved. They're born again by the Spirit of God. They're a new creature in Christ Jesus, and they can be filled with the Holy Spirit. When they're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit leads and guides them in agreement with the Scripture, in agreement with the Word of the Lord, not in contradiction to the Word of the Lord. So, the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless. And that means lawless, not just in the sense of any laws at all. It means lawless in the sense of not obeying the laws of God. Okay? And I don't mean the dietary laws of the Old Testament and the ceremonial laws of the law of Moses. I'm talking about laws that violate the greatest commandment. Laws that cause you not to love your neighbor as yourself not to agape one another. That's the lawless. And disobedient for the ungodly and sinners. That's who the law is for. Why? Because the only thing the law has ever done is identify sin. That's the only thing it did in the Old Testament, and that's the only thing it does 
in the New Testament. The law does not impart righteousness. The law informs you and identifies what is sin. And if it said it was sin when it was first written, it's still sin today. I want to say that again. I'm going to get right up here in the camera and tell you. If it said it was sin when it was first written, it is still sin today. Because God does not change. He doesn't care about our sophistication. He doesn't care about our modern sensibilities. He doesn't care that we have more education and more knowledge than those poor people did back then. Why? Because the human heart doesn't change. The hearts of individual people today are just the same without the Holy Spirit's intervention in their lives is just the same as it was in the days of Moses or the days of Noah or the days of Abraham. Human nature is the same. It doesn't matter what color your skin. It doesn't matter what your nationality. It doesn't matter your economics that you believe in. It doesn't matter about your politics. It doesn't matter. Human nature is the same all over the earth. And that's why the law of God is the same for all people of all races and all nations for all time because God never changes. So the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike, that means hit, their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and agape that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. All right, we've started reading Paul's mail to Timothy, and we'll continue with it in our next episode on reading Paul's mail. God bless you tonight.